Okay, so let's take one more, shall we? Uh, very quickly, uh, let's go to the phone line and say hello. You're on the air. Hi, this is Wendy in Squim, Washington. Hi, Wendy. Uh, Barbara's listening to uh, your story as well as am I, so go ahead. Okay. Um, well, this starts off with a Ouija board, huh. and my brother was living in a house which was a very large farmhouse originally uh, in a part of California called Rancho Cucamonga Upland area. Oh, yes, I know it, yes. Yes. Um, and anyway, he was there was like six or seven different apartments in the place that he stayed, that he lived in, that had all been carved out of this house. And he was using a Ouija board, and started to communicate with this um, something he wasn't aware of what it was, but he, he was being alarmed that the house, there was something in the house that was um, in danger, that the, there was going to be a bad thing that was going to happen uh, in the house, and was driving him in his dreams, even when he wasn't on the Ouija board, to trying to find out what this was. He finally started to um, get a sense that there was a family living in the house, and the father had been really abusive, and there were like six or seven kids, and apparently the two smaller of the kids were abused. I don't know exactly to, to what extent or all the details on that, but um, anyway, the, the house uh, was a place that was very sad because also um, at some point later the house had to be sold. My brother looked all the records up on the house later. The house had to be sold, uh, and so actually because it was a depression, people often did, took their riches and they buried them someplace in these homes. You bet. They would be able to come back to them. Sure. And so there was this big treasure in the house, is what this Ouija board was telling him, and there was different players that were different roles coming on the Ouija board. One time it was a little girl, one time it was the, the father who was very abusive and angry, and so it was a like huge drama playing out, you know, with my brother and this Ouija board. In the meantime... So what, does, what was he, excuse me, what was he trying to do? Different times reach back and get the same person so he could find out where? Yeah, he was really sucked into the story. He he was curious. He he felt, the other thing was, he he always appreciated something older, you know, the heritage part of life. Yes. And um, not very many people do that, really. So because um, he was sensitive to that, they, they, he appealed to them, and they appealed to him. And he was also lonely and living alone. And I think that probably didn't help things either. But there was just this, this wanting to reach out and communicate. Okay. Anyway, on with the story. So anyway, he he does eventually... Uh, is driven, he tells the landlord he's worried, there's some kind of maybe a, he thinks maybe it's an electrical problem, you know, he's he's uh, trying to solve it like a, you know, Sherlock Holmes, right? You could call it an electromagnetic problem, I guess. Yeah, so anyway, of course I think he's kind of, he tells me these stories, I believe that he's sane, I don't think he has, there, I have no reason to believe that he has lost touch with reality, let's okay. just put it that that's, way. That's fine. Uh, anyway, so he, he um, he finally ultimately does get the landlord to start looking around. And they do find on a very hot, you know, there's this really urgent messages on the, from the Ouija board telling him, you know, time is of the essence. You must, you must, you know, driving him to tell, you know, to get some, to find out what's wrong so the house doesn't burn down. And that's what they're trying to tell him. The house is going to burn down. Oh he doesn't God. know why. You know, he's terrified. His whole place is going to burn down. His birds, you know. His, yeah, his maybe, maybe the spirit was worried about the treasure. Well, you know... That's kind of a twist about the treasure, so you're okay. you're, you're, right. you're getting hot there. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, Proceed. You got, you got the good guts for these okay. kinds of stories, don't you? <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> all these years. Anyway, so um, he finally he, the landlord does you know okay you're crazy but I'll go and I'll look around I'll check everything so sure enough a hundred plus you know how hot it gets out there right regularly sure. and it's an old house hundred plus years well not quite a hundred years old but it was pushing a hundred years old lots of little hacks everywhere to make it in the depression so people could rent it as an apartment all over the place right so it's probably chevy parted if you will if you guys if anyone knows what that means still <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, so he goes up to the attic and it's over a hundred and ten degrees in the attic and there's a sure enough there's a faulty water heater up there oh, and it's it's it had they probably not gone up there the house probably would have burned down <laughs> 
But that's not the end of the story. So David goes, wow, could you believe that? You know, I saved the house from being burned down. And, right. Well, you know, and the, he didn't tell the landlord really the wall that was going on, obviously, because he didn't want the landlord to think he was nuts, right? <laughs> So then later, I think he's nuts. I'm thinking, oh, gosh. You know, and my mother, to just tell you a little bit about our family, she's a clairvoyant. I won't get into all the details, but she she would know who was in the cookie jar from two doors down, and there's four of us. And <laughs> she just had eyes behind her head, and she is, I won't go all the details on that. But um, anyway, uh, my, my brother is very clairvoyant, and I kind of think, well, maybe there's something to this. So my mother comes to visit, and she stays in his room. And where his bed is. And she gets in the bed and she's sleeping in the bed. And she feels this presence walking out of the closet, coming around the side of the bed, mm. and climbing into the bed with her. Mm. And my mother actually didn't feel threatened at all because she's so clairvoyant that she knew immediately that this was a child that wanted to get close to her that had known her son but didn't feel comfortable with a male person. Okay. And maybe didn't have much close, you know, personal relationship with the mother but needed a mommy, you know, her being a mommy and all. Got it. And so she kind of reached, you know, just reached out, you know, emotionally to reassure this child, you know. But then she told my brother, geez, Dave, you know. Anyway, so um, we all believed him. There's no reason not to believe him. There was a treasure. They they were trying to drive him through the Ouija board. But the last part of the story, I think my brother's kind of maybe a little off. Maybe he's too, just spending too much time alone, etc. So I was spending a lot of time with him, and I'm sitting up on his in his. He says he's moved from one apartment in the place to another one upstairs. Yes. And I'm sitting upstairs, and I'm and there's three people on this on this futon with our, all of our backs up against the wall. And my brother's sitting across the room, and we're all talking, right? Yeah. And what we don't know about the house is there was a staircase in the house that had been gutted. Uh, it had been taken out, you know. But originally, the plans had had an elaborate staircase, like many of these homes do, with the big, you know, little post all, uh, posts all the way up. And um, it had been gutted, though. It wasn't there anymore. All right. We're kind of running out of time here. Okay, so the, the, I'm sitting there, and I feel so clearly as day, some kid sitting with their back up against the stairs, pounding on my back up against the wall. Wow, yes. And I look to my right, and the two people don't feel it. <laughs> I mean, I heard it. I felt it. <laughs> I turned, and with my jaw, chin dropped, the people next to me, literally next to me, did not feel it, hear it, or understand what I was so alarmed about. Okay. I looked at my brother. We both smiled. God, what was the treasure? Well, there we never found the treasure. He searched, never found it. Okay. Thought it was a Rolex watch from yeah. the twenties. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much for the story. Um I would have liked for the treasure to have been located, but that much communication on a Ouija board well, frankly, even a little communication on a Ouija board is a very, very, very bad idea. Barb, uh welcome back. Thank you. You agree, with, but by the way, on the Ouija board? Oh yes, it's not a toy. It's not a toy, and so many people treat it that way, don't they? Well, well it's how it's promoted. Uh-huh. Um, uh huh. Um, Barb, you and I are both getting up there. I don't know how old you are, and I won't ask because you're a lady. But you know, I'm seventy. I'm hearing footsteps. I know eventually I'll be on the other side. Uh, yes. Is it your intent, Barbara, to try and communicate when you get there? Yes. I have every intention of doing my best uh, to to uh, let people know that I am still around. I've always told my brother, if you feel somebody tap you on the shoulder and you turn around and nobody's there, it's me. <laughs> I've always told my wife to watch the ceiling, and she usually slaps me. All right, let's go to number 10. <laughs> Number 10. <laughs> All right. This was in uh, Rollins Penitentiary. We did this prison many times. Um, this, We were in the uh, death house recording, and we had uh, Fox News with us at this location. Wow. On what, I think it was around Halloween time. Okay. And um, this voice uh, was recorded on three recorders and my video uh, recorder. Wow. Um, this one was rec recorded um, 
I think the one that's on the website was uh, done by Jenny, but everybody picked it up, and she was in a different location than me and Barry and Roger. That is so interesting. Three devices picking it up. Yeah, there was actually four. There was four. the three recorders and my video recorder. Okay. But you'll hear this voice say, I appear. <laughs> I appear. Okay, here we go. I appear. Ooh. I appear. I appear. Well, there's nothing at all uh, hard to hear about that, is there? I appear. And uh, I guess the next thing, let me hear that again. I appear. I appear. I appear. You know, if you could have heard that in real time, I think uh, I would have run. <laughs> Because there would have been obviously something about to manifest itself uh, right there. Yes, and and the thing that's so unique about this voice is every recorder, no matter where it was located at that time, picked it up just as loud. <laughs> um, it was loud. So, so do we theorize, because you don't hear these with your ear, right? That's correct. The majority of the time you don't. So then do we... Oh, the majority of the time. So every now and then? Every now and then it happened. Uh, uh, yeah, it happens, but I see. Uh, not very often. So and I wonder, do we often. imagine that they use electromagnetic energy to project these voices into the uh, the microphone or the device itself? I, I have no idea how they <laughs> do it. Yeah, I, I understand. Don't, I don't. <laughs> All right. All right. Uh, number 11. Um, you're going to hear Barry and Brendan. This is still at the Rollins prison. Um, they were walking into uh, the solitary confinement area, and they hear Roger talking in another section of the building. And um, Brendan asks Roger, "You're going to you're, you're going to hear Brendan ask uh, Brendan." Uh, <laughs> Brendan asks Barry, "Who's Roger talking?" with, you know, who's he with, and right. Barry responds sarcastically, he could be talking to somebody and have nobody with him, <laughs> and, and uh, the voice that uh, recorded, it sounds, uh, it's upset, and it says, you lose again, coward. Really? Okay, here we go. Who's Roger with, then? Uh, who's talking to somebody? He could be talking to somebody and have nobody with him. Well, maybe he can <laughs> yeah. Coward. Um that sounded like I would I would say a woman's voice, yes? Yes, and they had a woman's section, a woman's prison there in that prison. They had oh, a, a oh, small oh, section. Oh, 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 I understand. Okay, that uh, that explains it, I guess. Um, you did tend to go to a lot of, oh, I don't know, prisons, and um, did you go to hospitals? Uh, we tried. Uh, uh, in fact, there was one that was being torn down, and I thought it would be an excellent place to go uh, because I had had so many employees of that hospital and patients of that hospital tell me, how they had seen a woman in red in the original intensive care area. Uh -huh. And uh, so I waited until they relocated all the patients and all the machines and all their stuff out of the hospital, and I had approached the uh, members of their board of directors if we could conduct an investigation there before it was torn down. I would imagine in years past it would have been easier. All the uh, attention now to the paranormal, TV shows, radio shows, well, investigators many, many crawling all over ago. the place. Yeah, exactly. It was a lot of years ago before people were really mm -hmm. doing this much of it because now I'm sure there's a lot of no's that are given out. Well, yeah, they would not let me do it uh, even though it was being torn down. Do you believe, Barbara, that the collection that we're hearing tonight, and so many more, so, so many more, are evidence, absolute evidence of people who have died? 
to me it is. I don't know how else um, how it could be explained any other way. I, I to me I have no doubt about life continuing. Your your body you might be dead, but you continue. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's do another one, if we dare. I, I believe this would be uh, number thirteen. No, this is twelve. This is twelve. Okay. There you go. I'm wrong. Sorry about that. That's okay. Uh, you're going to hear Brendan. He's talking to the prison director, and you will hear her ask uh, him, "What, what do you do with it?" And she, she's referring to uh, CDs that he had made for her uh, while we had been at the prison previously. Okay. And uh, he responds and say, he says, uh, "I've got it because I make backups of all of them." And a voice joins the conversation and says, I have to go now. I'm dead. Oh, my. Um, okay, here we go. What are you doing? I've still got it, because I make backups of all of them. I have to go now. I'm dead. I have to go now. I'm dead. I have to go now. I'm dead. Uh, oh, that one is... Uh, Shockingly clear, I'm afraid. Um, there may be some people who have a problem with it, um, but I'm not one of them. I, ha- uh, I have to go now. I'm dead. One more time. I've got to do this again. What are you doing? I've still got it because I make backups of all of them. I have to go now. I'm dead. I have to go now. I'm dead. That's just uh, totally too creepy. I'm I'm glad I didn't, and I almost skipped it. Good Lord! Uh, so <laughs> <laughs> I have to go now. I'm dead. I guess they get busy on the other side. Um, you know, actually, in, in even though that was horribly creepy, uh, it would sh- suggest that I I don't know. Maybe he's headed to a gin rummy game or. I'm trying to think the best here, <laughs> you know, or some some activity that they have over on the other side. I have to go now. I'm dead. Catch you later. Um, I, I don't know. I, I, I'm going to ask you in a little while if you uh, if you've ever I don't know discerned something about what's on the other side, what awaits us. This is dead air. Welcome to Dead Air. This is Midnight in the Desert via Skype worldwide. If on a computer, please be sure to use a headphone mic and call MITD 51. That's MITD 51. And so, it continues. Good evening, everybody. I'm Mark Bell, and this is Dead Air. Indeed, mid warning, this is rough stuff. You're hearing the voices of the dead. That's right, the voices of the dead. This is uh, the GIS that has uh, done the work for you over many, many years and thousands of hours of recording, transporting themselves to uh, locations where they thought they could get things and getting them. And here is, uh, once again, Barbara Macbeth. Uh, Barbara, welcome back. Thank you. Let's do a couple and then a couple of ghost stories. Uh, we're sort of just jumping all over the place tonight, so uh, I'm taking it. I hope you're keeping track with me. I would think the next one would be 13. You're right. Okay, good. Good for once. Uh, this is a private residence, and uh, you'll hear Brendan say, I tell you what, it is hot in this house. <laughs> and... He recorded um, this voice, and I don't know what it was referring to, but it says, she didn't put it down. Hmm. 
Put it down. All right, here we go. I tell you what, it is hot in this house. Put it down. All right, I have an observation about that one right away, and that is, not only is it clear, but it's almost too clear. I mean, it's almost like, you know, somebody was in the room actually saying that, uh, of course, we have no idea what it means, and... I trust you implicitly, Barb, but if I didn't know better, I'd say that's, you know, like somebody in the room. That's how clear it is, although there is a a certain sound that comes with it that's a little bit unnerving, huh? Yes, and it, the difference, I think, that you're hearing is Brendan used a condensed microphone, and it was recorded into his computer. Ah, Okay. That would explain it, but a good one. Oh, a good one. I tell you what, it is hot in this house. Put it down. Put it down. Put it down. So she didn't put it down, but there's no way, no way to know what that means, huh? No. I mean, it wasn't, it, it, it's, uh, what it's saying isn't relating to anything that was being said or done at that time. Barbara, you, you do this, uh, but how do you sleep at night? I sleep very well. <laughs> you do, huh? Oh, yes. <laughs> this, this doesn't scare me. I find it very fascinating. People that have witnessed ghosts, uh, like a full apparition, yes. they, I feel like they are very fortunate, and I feel like we have been very fortunate that we have recorded so many voices that they have talked to us, like what they have done. Did you hear the opening story? It was from Heather, actually. Um, yes. Oh, my. That's called Up Close with an Apparition. Yes, and she's, she's very fortunate to have experienced that because there are so many people especially people that research it and all the ghost investigators that are out there now, mm -hmm. they would love to experience something like that. Um, they would give anything to experience that. I guess that would be true of ghost investigators, but it would not be true of me. <laughs> that tells you why I'm not a ghost investigator. Just hearing these voices puts a chill down my spine, and I guess we might as well do the next one, though I'm almost <laughs> hesitant. Um, tell me about it. This, this was in the same... Um, in fact, it was the same day, and Brendan uh, recorded this in the same house. Uh, he says, is anyone here? Does anyone want to talk to me? And this voice was recorded, there was blood. There was blood? Uh-huh. Okay, here we go. Is anyone here? Do you want to talk to me? Ah. Oh, good Lord. Um... There was blood, at least it's past tense. Now, if that voice had said there will be blood, <laughs> it wouldn't matter. I mean, you, you don't hear it until you get home. But uh, if it had said there will be blood, then I guess I'd count myself lucky that I got home at all. <laughs> hey, re relax for just a moment, Barbara. God, that, that was awful. Um, we're, on Skype, we have Katie. Do you have a good ghost story, Katie? Yes, sir. Okay, proceed. Um, first off, I just want to tell you I love you oh, and well, your you. family. I pray for y'all all the time. And all um, the time, you got to be from the south. Yes, okay. sir. Okay. I live um, on the Arkansas Louisiana line. All right, that explains it. Yep, and I think that ghost on that EVP was saying she didn't turn the air conditioner down. Was why it was so hot in there. <laughs> I'd have to listen back for it, but God, it's creepy listening to those voices. Anyway, go ahead. Okay. 
So um, one night I had went to sleep and I had this horrible dream that this demon thing was at the end of my bed grabbing my feet trying to pull me off the bed. Yes. And just I woke a, just up. Just a dream though, right? Yes, it started out as a dream. Oh. oh. And I woke up and I sat up and I was like, oh, goodness. And um, I felt something on my feet and I was like, uh, I happened to look down there and it was actually really there grabbing my feet and I felt it trying to pull me and I started kicking and I was just like, leave in the name of Jesus, leave in the name of Jesus because that's what my mama told me to always do if I ever sure. encountered anything. Sure. It, it left. I was like, ooh, Jesus, okay. when, that's to help me. Yes, when you looked down and you say you saw it, what did you see? Hands or, I mean, a whole, a what? I saw this impish looking thing. It, it might have been like four, four and a half feet tall. It had like scaly looking skin. Aye, its, aye, aye. its hands had pointy nails and it was grabbing around my ankles and on my feet. Aye. It just horrified me. Um, I completely understand. Um, all right. Thank you so very much for that story. I think Barb, um, what did you think about that? Well, I, that is not a ghost, whatever she experienced there. Um, uh, that's not a ghost. No. You would classify that? That's a different kind of an entity. Uh, if she experienced something like that and that's what she saw, uh-huh. that's a different kind of an entity. Have you, <laughs> I, I'm afraid to even ask, but have you encountered that different kind of entity in your work? Uh, I have in, not what she described, but I have encountered different kinds of entities before um, the GIS, just in my upbringing, yes. That's scary. That's legitimately scary. All right, uh, let's grab one more quick ghost story here from Jazz Monday in Australia. Hello there. Hi, Art. Hi. Scary night. Scary night indeed. (laughs) Yes, so uh, back in 96, my brother was suffering a deep depression and he hardly ever came out of his room and one day I found him unresponsive in his bed mm. with a empty bottle of pills and a note and wow. the paramedics came they worked on him for what seemed like hours and uh, at one stage they thought they had lost him and then they were able to revive him and uh, stabilise him enough to get him to the hospital long story short they did get him to the hospital he did survive um, He's since turned his life around. He's no longer in a deep depression, and he's living overseas with a wife and family. Um, So fast forward to earlier this year, and my sister and I were helping out at my parents' house, and she was putting her son to bed in one of the bedrooms. As she exited the room, um, she was startled because she thought she saw a solid human figure with its back towards her, who she categorically claims was my brother, uh, because you sort of know the look of someone you've known for all your life of when course. you see them from oh, behind. Of course. And she sees him turn and walk into the bedroom, and um, she knows at that time, like, she called out to him, um, and I heard her actually call out to him, and, like, she knew full well at the time that it couldn't have been him because he wasn't there. So she walks down the hallway, turns into the bedroom, and there is nobody there, and no way anyone could have gotten out. <laughs> so... Now, you and me, Art, would probably leap to some paranormal explanation, um, but my sister doesn't come from our, our world that we come from. Right. Uh, she didn't graduate from the Art Bell uh, Paranormal Community <laughs> College, and so she puts it down to sleep deprivation of a new mother. So we go down, well, she came downstairs to me and my mum with a puzzled look on her face, and I asked her why she called out to Marcus, and she proceeds to tell my mother and I what she just saw, and Art, my mother's face went white as a ghost, uh, pardon the pun. Um, my sister then asks her what's wrong, and my mum proceeds to tell us that she never told anyone this because she didn't want to seem like she was crazy. Um, but one day she was putting linen away in the closet, and she caught something out of the side of her eyes, and long story short, she sees exactly the same thing that my sister did, um, and followed, called out to him, followed him, and nobody was there. So uh, I didn't witness this, but my mum's expression 
and the colour draining from her face when my sister relayed the story was just all the proof that I basically need. Now, is that a ghost? Is okay, so, a... so we've got two people, Jazz, processing it in very different ways, obviously, according to their own world view. I guess that's what we do as humans, right? Oh, definitely. And this was like 10 years apart between uh, my sister seeing it and my mother seeing it. And, like, I, I, like, I don't know what it is. Is it a loop? Um, is it something that's being replayed over and over? Because my brother's not dead. Um, he was suffering a deep depression and he spent a lot of time in that room. And we always assume that hauntings are the result of, like, when a death is you know, very sudden, or it's violent, or, yes. you know, there's some kind of unrequited love or something like that. And, um, you know, depression's a deep, strong emotion. Oh, yes. um, Was that something that was lingering, that, that emotion is lingering, causing that? Or he actually clinically died in his, in his room while they were reviving him, was perhaps a part of his soul, um, if you believe in that, oh, I do. Uh, left behind. I, I do, Jazz, I do. Thank you so much. No problem. Have a good night. So, uh, yeah, Barb. Um, That's a doppelganger. Is that what it is? Yes. They they saw the ghost of someone who's alive. Yeah. Um, and and projected. Uh, you, with that, Barb, that kind of depression that he described, uh, combined yeah. with, um, you know, a, a near-death experience or a death experience, depending on how you want to look at it, I guess, uh, could project some pretty strong stuff, right? Well, yes. That could be residual, a residual uh, experience uh, that from just the emotion that this young man was going through at that time in his life burned something in that room, that atmosphere. Gotcha. All right, Barb, uh, two questions for you. One I've been waiting to ask, and that is, have you, in the years you've been doing this, gleaned anything at all about the nature of the other side? I think uh, the nature of the other side depends a lot on that individual's mental state. I think, uh, I, I, in fact, I kind of worry about the generation coming up. Don't we all? <laughs> yeah, uh, on on uh, their on. Uh, how the ghost will be in the future, <laughs> you know. I mean, there is so much turmoil. Well, we are the future ghosts, and then, uh, then, or as as they will then be. Um, one other question, and that is about suicides, Barbara. Um, mm -hmm. Have you discerned anything at all about suicides versus natural or even unnatural deaths? Um. I've known some people that have committed suicide, and their families have all experienced um, activity. Their, their, I don't believe their soul and their spirit is at peace after they've died. I think they're they're still in turmoil. Wow. I think the mental state of the person continues. Okay. All right. Let's do number fifteen. All right, this was uh, at an old western military fort uh, that was established back in the 1800s, and it's still in use today. Uh, Barry was in the museum, and uh, which used to be uh, one of the barracks, and he recorded this child's voice. Uh, it says, it's dark in here. Yeah. Um, it was not dark um, in that room at the time. There were still lights on. Gotcha. Um, but when, when, we, when we went back to that location and we were talking to the curator of the museum and, and uh, told him about this child's voice, uh, he informed us that he had just learned a few weeks prior that women and children were kept in the basement of the barracks for their own safety. The women, the wives of soldiers, were referred to as laundresses. Wow. And uh, to keep them uh, safe, uh, they lived in the basements of these barracks. Because uh, we were surprised to get a child's voice there on this military base, you know. I can imagine, of course, yes. Um, here we go. 
Wow. I'm going to have to replay that for you, I think. Um, it was quite clear and quite fast, so let me do it again. Oh, that is a little child's voice. There's no question about it. One more time, please. Yeah, that's um, awful. <laughs> uh, you know, obviously, it's dark then in a different realm altogether, yeah. the other yeah. side. And I, I don't want to think of the other side. It's dark. <laughs> Maybe this poor child made a wrong turn, a.k.a. John Lear. Um, I don't know. So. The curator was quite surprised that we had recorded a child's voice, and he he was uh, quite fascinated that we had. Yes. Um, yes. All right. One more. One more. And uh, it's number 16, and it's pretty... This has been heard before. Yes. But this is the creepiest, oh, the creepy, oh, the creepy. It really is. <laughs> Tell us about it. Um, this is in a cemetery. And it's one of our favorite places to go. We get great EVP out of this cemetery. And we were discussing some ghost pictures that had been developed, and we were looking at them and talking about them. And we recorded this uh, voice. I think that she came to self-realization of her situation, and she says, I'm completely dead. The moment of realization, huh? Okay, here we go. Um, okay, so we don't have that one uh, repeated unless I repeat it, and I shall indeed repeat it. I'm completely dead. Okay, what's being said is I'm completely dead, and there's absolutely no mistake about it. One more time. I'm completely dead. Oh, that, that's so weird. I mean... It must not have been, it might not have been the instant of recognition that, that that person was dead, but it had not been a long time since that person found out they were dead. That would be my conclusion. Would you agree? I, uh, very, very possible. That cemetery is so active. In fact, one night, I thought I'd tell you a little ghost story. Okay, we, we don't have the time. It'll have to be on the oh. other side. Oh, okay. Other That's side fine. of the other side, you know, break, the other side. This is dead air in progress. This one's getting to me. I've got the uh, lights turned down in here. And uh, this is just some pretty freaky stuff, what can I say? And we've got uh, another full hour of it coming up. You're listening to Barbara Macbeth, who's kind of here on and off in between the ghost stories with her own EVPs, the best probably EVPs ever played on the air. Many of these, most of these, actually never heard uh ever before on the air, and uh, very disturbing EVPs at that. Uh, back, to, back to Barbara. You said you had a bit of a story, Barb. This is quick, and it's kind of comical. Sure. Uh, in that cemetery, um, we would always get uh, cold drinks in a paper cup at a place and maybe french fries and a hamburger to eat before we'd start our investigation at the cemetery. And Roger had finished his drink, and we were walking down the road, and he tossed his empty cup into a garbage can that was chained to a tree. And the cup came flying back up and arched, and he he could have really almost caught it if he would have tried. (laughs) It went into the garbage can and came flying back out. (laughs) Oh, God. Um, I take it that... That kind of activity was not frequent, because uh, you just couldn't keep doing this if it was. Uh, we, had, we had quite a bit of activity that really? we witnessed, yes. Uh, well, then you guys had iron spines, that's all I can say. 
All right. Um, let's uh, do one more, and then we'll take a ghost story. So, um, number 17. Yeah, 17. Yeah. This is a uh, old building um, where a new age business is, is now residing. Originally, this building, uh, which a lot of the buildings in our town, uh, had brothels upstairs, uh, the main uh, buildings. Must have been a long time ago. Yes, back in, this is a railroad town. Uh-huh. And um, so Barry recorded this voice. He was upstairs, but they called the cribs where the uh, girls would work, little small rooms. And uh, he was winding up and getting. we were getting ready to leave. And we have the impression that this female ghost kind of liked him. She's, you hear this voice, she says, going to miss you, and I mean it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I guess, uh, let me just play it. I guess there's humor on the other side. Okay, uh, that's only a single play, so I'm going to have to do it again. So you're listening to this. Well, it's a young lady, all right. I'm going to miss you, and I mean it. Can everybody hear that? I'll do it one last time. Uh, it was from a brothel, and I guess uh, I guess he made an attachment, so to speak. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. That's probably her routine line that she'd give when they'd leave. Maybe, maybe. But uh, once you're on the other side, I, I guess you don't get to utter too much that people hear. And that's kind of a key. I mean, you're there with uh, electromagnetic pickups and hearing things that other people don't hear. So it makes you wonder how often does an entity, a ghost, try and communicate unsuccessfully? Probably most of the time. Probably most of the time. So the connection from their world to our world is, well, at best, very tenuous. Um, all right, hold tight, Barb. Let's go to Skype and see if Daniel's got a good one for us. Hi, Daniel. Hey, Art. Hey. Hey, oh, I'm so glad to be on because you have combined two of my favorite shows, the EVPs and the ghost stories. It's gotcha. Awesome. Yeah, I know. It's pretty cool. So my ghost story starts in 2006. I went to a, a really small uh, private college in North Georgia, and the ghost legends around there are really sort of famous among the students. Mm -hmm. But uh, the one that I always heard, because I was a theater kid, is uh, in our little black box theater was the spirit of Jesse, who was very big into the theater, always played an older role if they needed him, and uh, was supposedly a janitor who died in a car crash. Right. And... I experienced little things with Jesse, but he really got me one night when it was my first date with the woman who would become my wife. Oh. We set up a little a little uh, TV to watch a movie, and I dragged a couch in, and I was one of, like, three people who had a key to this place after hours. Mm -hmm. So we watched our movie, and the thing you have to understand about this black box is, in the middle, it's a wide open space for two floors. So when you're in the, th the middle of it, you can see not only the hallway around you, mm -hmm. but you can see the hallway up above you with <laughs> perfect clarity. So we're sitting there talking on the couch. Movie's over. It's dark except for one single light on, ironically called the ghost light. And we're sitting there, and all of a sudden we hear footsteps up above us. And so we look at each other, and we're really freaked out. And we sit there, and Art, I kid you not, up above us, we hear these footsteps go running from one side to the other side. Mm -hmm. And they sound like boot steps. Very, very loud. Obviously someone there. And Art, we can see it. We can look up there and see every bit of that, and no one is there. Nobody is there. So as no. the footsteps go, there's nobody there. Yeah. Uh -huh. So they do this, and we, we sort of pass it off at first when we go back to talking. So then it happens two, three more times until, I kid you not, we, we're done. Mm -hmm. We are so for, we're in two college kids in the middle of a dark theater, and we say we're out of here. Screw this! I mean, we're we're out. I'd have been out <laughs> the first time, maybe maybe the second time. First time, I guess you could put it off to something. Yeah. But uh, when there are footsteps going right past you that you should be seeing something attached to them, uh, and you don't, 
twice would be not nice. Oh, and it's it's not just footsteps. Man. They are running. They are heavy boots, and they it. are booking it from one end to the other. I got you. And the real punchline to it is that this is maybe January. I graduated months later. So right before I graduate, I talked to the head of the theater department. We're sitting in her office just chatting, and I happened to bring up Jesse because I never – truly believe the legend behind him. I'd experienced him. I knew he was there. I totally felt that. But I didn't believe in the legend. Okay. And she goes, oh, no, no, no. She said, he wasn't a janitor. And I said, excuse me? You know, I'm floored. She said, oh, I knew Jesse. He wasn't a janitor. He was a cook. He loved the theater. He absolutely adored it. And she goes, actually, and she reaches around and she grabs a picture and she hands me the picture and there was Jesse. And she absolutely confirmed that not only was Jesse a real man, not only did he love that theater, but that she believed that he was there, too. I mean, it, it sent chills down. <laughs> All right. Thank you so very, very much for the uh, uh, the call. And let's go to Santa Rosa, I think, California, on the phone. You're on the air. Hi. My name's Kathy. Hi, Kathy. Uh, this took place in Marin. Um, I occasionally am called to help people if they have a disruptive spirit or weird energy in their house. And... Some people down there had built an add-on to their home in Marin. They added a guest room on the back, and every time somebody stayed in it, they always wound up on the couch in the morning saying that it was freezing in there, that they were, they didn't feel good, it was too cold, there was something wrong with their air conditioning, and sometimes it looked cloudy in there. So they would mm -hmm. always wind up kind of afraid sleeping on the couch. And They didn't deal with it too much because they didn't use it to sleep in themselves, but then one day they decided they were redoing their house and they were varnished a mantle over the fireplace. And when they woke up in the morning, there was a little child's footprints in the varnish going across the top of the mantle, and they didn't have any kids. So they got a little freaked out about that, and they decided they were going to, they knew someone who knew me, and they just said, would you just come over and take a look at this, what's going on in our house, kind of an energy feng shui, I suppose. Sure. And I went there with a couple of friends, and I have some abilities to do this, so we <laughs> we walked into the room, we opened the door, and it <laughs> It was like walking into a refrigerator. Uh, it was really, really cold. I mean, they said it's never been this bad. And uh, we could see kind of a, a hazy, almost just a lightly milky cloud right in the middle of the room. And it happened to be just right where the bed was. Mm. And I went and I said, well, let's just stop for a moment and take a breath. And I, I said, hello, who are you? Is there someone there? Yes. Who are you? And... Um, I, it moved toward me, and I, no one else could hear this, but I heard it right next to my ear. It said, Mother. I'm right. looking for my mother. Oh. I I kind of got a little, well, okay, this is intense. So I said, what happened to you? And I saw a picture of a swimming pool. And they also had mentioned to me that occasionally they found piles of uh, little bits of water in the, in the floor. Really? In that room. And there was actually some dampness on the floor when we were there. So we actually walked out of the room because it was really intense and we were having a little bit of a hard time with it you actually I, saw water on the floor a little water there was little little you know damp piles of water just wow. like three or four of them leading out the door i so and know where this is going i'm afraid well, they had actually had the plumber come and check they had the air conditioning mm. check they thought there was something wrong with the house right so i sat down and um i asked them have you ever had a swimming pool in the backyard and they said no there's never been a pool there and i said you mm. sure they said, well, let's, we can call our next-door neighbor. They had someone who lived there for 50 years. They gave her a call while I was there, and she said, well, yeah, some 10 years ago there was a swimming pool there, and they, the people who lived there, their three-year-old daughter had drowned in the pool. Oh, my God, I knew it, yeah. And what had happened is that the father was, he blamed the mother, and he was so livid, he literally showed up with bulldozers, I guess, and bulldozed the pool and filled it with earth, and um, they moved out. And two years later, the mother, evidently, who had never gotten over it, died in a car accident. It was a single car accident. There was some speculation that she had killed herself. And the little girl was, um, so as I talked, they told me this, I said to the little girl spiritually, just telepathically, can I help you? And she said again, I, I will need to find my mother. And um, I did a few things that I know how to do in terms of assisting spirits to move on and reconnected her to let her know she didn't have to stay there. And I did manage to reconnect her with her mother and help them both move on. That poor and little girl. Do you have any, I mean, we hear, you know, with these EVPs, we hear so many children 
Um, do you have any clue? I, you know, I'm going to go back and ask Barbara again, but I mean, we think, we adults, we, we somehow think that if a child like that drowns in a pool, they're not going to some ne- nether region where there is nothing or darkness or cold or whatever. Uh, they're going directly to heaven without passing go, but it doesn't seem that way. Um, where is, yeah, was know. that child, where was that child trapped? She was trapped in the anger between her parents. They didn't let go of her. She was really, she was actually trying to heal her mother. One of the reasons she didn't leave was because she was really in pain about the fact that her mother literally disappeared spiritually. She just went kind of in such deep depression and the entire family was destroyed. And on some level, the little girl was still trying to find them and, and heal it so she could move on and finish the cycle with them. And uh, it was a very, very painful thing. We were all very sad when we got done, but uplifted because we actually were able to assist them. And Well, them that's, go a, and that's a whale of a story. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Take care. Um, you know, it's hard. This thing with kids is really hard for me. Uh, the adults, well, you can imagine all kinds of long lives lived, right, um, in in error or sin or however you want to look at it, and they're being trapped but not children. So there must be many things that we truly do not understand about we, you know, what we call the other side. Uh, here once again is Barbara Macbeth. Hi, Barbara. Boy, that was some Hi. story, huh? Yes, it was. She actually yeah. got into a dialogue with a little little three-year-old. My goodness. And uh, hopefully the people that live in that house have never experienced her again. And she has moved on, hopefully. It would be interesting to know. You know, when I ask you about the something about, you know, tell us something about the other side, you really can't. I, I do understand that. But do you believe, you do believe, right, that this is some sort of, I don't know, middle area um, before you go on to wherever your final destination, I'm I'm not trying to spit out movie titles here, is. Well, you're getting into theology. Yeah, a bit, a bit. uh, You know, I, I just believe that we continue on. I believe that it's a learning process. That this is just one of the one of the lessons, life's lessons here, okay. and we continue on. Number eighteen. All right, you're going to hear uh, Brendan and Barry. We were investigating a mortuary, and uh, Barry recorded this. And you'll hear Barry say to Brendan, "I hope there's no bodies down there." Mm-hmm. Um, and this voice tells him to talk to the dead. And there was several bodies down there. We we didn't know it. Uh, there was a couple of us that went down in the in the basement, and there was probably about nine bodies on slabs in yeah. this room. On slabs? Yeah. All right, here you go. Okay, that was very fast. Let me try and do it again here. Uh, many of these earlier at earlier times were repeated. Uh, let me try it again. Okay, that's a little hard for me to hear, so I'm going to do it one more time and see if I can hear it. Yep, talk to the dead. That's what it is. Talk to the dead. That time I got it clearly. These old ears are trying. All right, uh, so yes, there it was. Talk to the dead. And now I'm, you know, in view of the discussion we just had, let's push on to number 19. All right. This was recorded in a cemetery, and I think we've played this one on uh, your show before, but you're going to hear wind blowing and a baby crying throughout the whole time. It was uh, after midnight, and there was absolutely no children around, and the EVP is not looped. This whole crying episode is just what was recorded. Okay. (laughs) 
Now you see, it doesn't seem. My God, that was awful. I, I mean, how could a infant, a baby, be caught on the other side? That's uh, that's awful. Yes, and some people think they hear it laughing. So um, it depends really? On how you hear it? Really laughing? Uh, you know that would be nicer. Let me tr- let me try again. Hold on. Thank you, Barbara. Um, it's the power. It's either the power of suggestion, or I'm not really sure. But it does indeed. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Sound like laughing. So <laughs> it was written. You know, it, it, it helps me a lot. You'll never know. Uh, it says baby crying, and I thought, oh God, baby crying, not good. And and when you made that suggestion. Maybe it's just the power of the mind. Yeah, who knows? I honestly don't know, but, uh, yeah, amazing stuff. All right, let's go to Skype briefly and say hello to Brian. Hey, hey how's it going? Uh, well, it's a pretty wild night, Brian, as you can hear. Oh, yeah, definitely. Okay, so are you going to, first of all, turn off your device, please. Is that better? Yeah, it needs to be off. And uh, if you have a ghost story for us, proceed. All right, this actually has to do with a uh, listener that calls into you a few times, uh, Jack W. Uh, he's a good good friend of mine. He took me into a cemetery near us, and uh, we decided to take a mirror in there one time. And it was uh, not a good thing, we found out, because it actually got extremely hot in my hands. The mirror uh, it, did? Uh, yes, it did. Uh, and then uh, pretty much every time after that, I've been in that cemetery two or three more times, and every time I've been in there, I've had a really difficult time breathing every time. Breathing? Yeah. Well, there are weird things in the paranormal world with mirrors, scrying and such. It's uh, mir- Mirrors are strange in a way, huh? Yes, they are. I appreciate your story. It was short and quick. Uh, the way to do it. Thank you very much. So, what do you all think about that? Uh, I'm, I'm kind of glad that uh, he brought it up. Uh, Barbara, mirrors. Um, are you aware of anything with regard to mirrors that is strange, unusual, paranormal? Yes. yes. Mirrors, to me, are weird. There's a, a lot of, uh, well, there's some cultures, I don't know if they still do it, but I know they used to do it when a person would die. Yes. They'd put mirrors up because the dead supposedly does not like seeing themselves. Huh. Can't you think the dead can even can see themselves? I don't know. I, I don't know. I just know that that, that has been uh, a procedure of certain cultures in the past. I see. Um, Brendan experienced seeing uh, that child in the mortician's house. It looked like uh, his neck was broke. It wasn't fitting right. Brendan saw his reflection in the mirror. Gosh, no thanks. That's horrible. (laughs) All right, Barb. Hold on. I'm going to... uh... I'll put you on hold and venture forth. Uh, We've been getting quite the night tonight. Lake Charles, Louisiana, I do believe. Hello. Art, thank you for replaying the baby because I'm sitting here and I had chill bumps. Um, Do you kind of agree? I mean, when you first hear it, you go, oh, God, a baby. But then when you listen closely, she's right. I think it's laughing. It got better. I want to think it was laughing. Okay. This is Michael. So I've lived in Lake Charles, born and raised here, uh, but in 2004, I moved to Alaska to be a youth pastor for church. I was was living in Seward and had was invited to come and speak at a church in Fairbanks. Mm -hmm. It's about a nine-hour drive. From the south, not used to, I was got there in January. This was in February. I uh, took out on this trip by myself and, uh, 
had been given tips and this is where you want to stop, this is where you don't want to stop, gas sure. is real expensive here, things like oh, that. Yes. So I got out of just north of Anchorage, north of Wasilla, and uh, up in that part of the country I had been, the people that I had been with had stopped and picked up hitchhikers and they just said it's just kind of a, a thing, you don't really do it in Louisiana, but here it's life and death if you see somebody on the road. That's fact. Not gonna... So uh, I saw a man walking north on the road and I pulled over mm -hmm. he got in the truck and I remember distinctly he had a kind of a, a little bit of a body odor smell he smelled like a campfire <laughs> uh, His he was unshaven his name he told me was Alex he spoke with a Russian accent and he said he was a mountain climber and he was uh, he said his favorite place on earth was the top of Mount Everest and that he was in Alaska to climb Mount McKinley. So he was on his way to Denali Park. He rode with me in the car for about two and a half hours, asking me about why I was there, about my calling that I felt on my life and feel on my life, discussed thing, those types of things with me, gave me tips about driving in the ice, and told me not to do things that would have caused error. Right. And we came to... We came to a, a town called Trapper Creek. I don't know if you're familiar. Uh, and I was not going to get gas there. It was one of the places I was told they will the, the prices will kill you there. <laughs> and uh, he said, you'll want to stop here because the weather is too bad. Denali is the part where I was planning to stop. They're going to be closed. And so I said, okay. And he'd been in the car for two and a half hours. We talked extensively about Everest and his plan to to see the top of Mount McKinley. Well, we stopped. I got out, started fueling the car. He grabbed his small backpack that he had, walked into, I saw him walk into the gas station, a little junction station, uh, had a little cafe in it. He walked through the doors. When I finished filling up, I went in to use the restroom and pay and grab a bite. And I, uh, I asked the clerk, I said, where's the man that just walked in? And uh, she looked at me and said, you're the only one who's been here for hours. Mm -hmm. And I said, no, a man just walked through these doors. Uh, we spent 20 minutes walking around the back of the building. We followed the tracks back to the two sets of tracks back to the truck. He was nowhere to be found. There was icy wetness where he had been sitting in the truck. Really? The truck still, the truck still smelled like him. So at that point, I have I've chalked it up to, you know, was it a ghost? Was it an angel? I don't know what it. I wouldn't have had enough gas when I got to Denali. That gas station was indeed closed. Well, here's what I'll say. Uh, it may be that living on the other side, as he may have been doing, he uh, could spend time on Everest because I can assure you, the average human being can't breathe at the top of Everest. Not for long. There are a few who claim they've tried. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, there is not enough oxygen up there to support a human being. And frequently, the stay on Everest is, is not somewhere... It, look, put it this way. there's It's not a place you lollygag around at all. You get there, and then you get down, if you can, as fast as you can. Okay, uh, let's go back to uh, to Barb, and uh, we've got the next one coming up that just is awful. <laughs> uh, it may have been heard on the air before. So many of these have not been, but uh, this is uh, number 20 we're talking about here. Right. Uh, we were in a mausoleum, and Roger recorded this voice. Um, you don't hear Roger, but it's just the EVP that is on this one, and I don't think that this one's looped either. Okay. But um, you, Roger had said, uh, talking about our our, vid our video camera infrared lights, he, he had s apologized to any ghosts there saying that our lights would not hurt them. Mm -hmm. And he recorded this voice saying, our death gate. And you can hear 
this voice kind of echoey. You know, it was, it's all marble walls and floors and ceilings. Okay. All right. Our Death Gate. Uh, not one I like. And uh, hold on. We're going to get to it here. Uh, I'm going to have to play this, I think, several times for you. Death Gate, that, w- that would mean where you go to die. <laughs> so that one is um, sort of whispered, I would say. Listen carefully. Yep, that's a whisper. That's definitely a whisper. I wonder why, uh, one more time, I wonder why somebody on the other side would feel it necessary to whisper. Very quickly, Barb, any thoughts on that? Why Why would they whisper? I don't know. I think it takes a lot of their energy to even uh, be able to be heard on a recorder. I think I don't think that that's something that comes easy to them. Well, if that were true, you'd think they'd almost have to shout. Um, but that that whisper got through quite effectively. I, I just, you know, it just seems strange to me. Not many of the ones that you've recorded are whispers, but I know some are. Okay. All right. All right, Barb, uh, hold tight. We're coming to the uh, bottom of the hour. At the top of the morning, probably, for the majority of you out there. Dead air underway for the, well, now only minutes away from Halloween and in many, many locations listening to me right now, it is Halloween. Uh, Let's quickly go to Robert on Skype and say hi. Hi, Art. Roswell. Thank you. Back just away a little bit. You're loud. Oh, sorry. How's this? Better. Okay, cool. Anyways... Uh, me and my cousin, you, we usually go to these... Uh, uh, Robert, again, uh, Robert, uh, you and I have to have a talk. Um, you, this call isn't going to work. I, you have called me about six times now, still not having fixed whatever it is going on. I'm so sorry with your audio, but you're going to have to work on that. Uh, here's what I recommend. There is a, a Skype Echo server, Robert. And you can call it and uh, talk to it, and it will play back your audio, and then you'll hear what your audio is doing. I'm terribly sorry we can't get you on. I, I really, truly am. But uh, uh, you've tried that about a half dozen times now with the same setup, and it's just not going to do the job. So try the Skype, Skype Echo. It will work for you. It's pretty cool anyway. Um, so let's try this one on Skype. Hello. Hello. Hi. Do you have a ghost story for us? Am I on the air? <laughs> you are. Okay, great. Boy, do I have a good one for you. Go ahead. Alrighty. Um, just a little bit of background. I am a musician, and uh, one of my friends uh, is also a musician, and he was playing for a wedding um, not too far from where I live. So what ended up happening was, you know, he finished the wedding. He finished the you know, the gig, and uh, a couple of the people there invited him to have a drink. So he said, okay, well, let me just have a short beer, but I have to get back home because I have my wife and kids waiting for me. So, you know, time passed by, and he uh, ended up leaving, like, at 2 o'clock in the morning. So he checked his phone, and his wife had called him, like, 20 times. <laughs> yes. So you knew he was in trouble. <laughs> so... What ended up happening was this guy uh, got into his car, and he was going 90 miles per hour on a 60-mile-per-hour road. Oh, my. And he said, you know what? Well, it's like 2 o'clock in the morning. You know, there's no cops around. So let me just go ahead and just, you know, Open her go up. real quick and, uh, you know, try to get back home because my wife is going to, like, lay the hammer on me. So. Mm-hmm. What ended up happening was all of a sudden he saw uh, a couple of signal lights from a cop. So he was all like, oh, man, you know, like I'm going to get home late and I'm going 90 miles per hour on the 60 mile per hour road. Might not get home at all in that situation. (laughs) Yeah, okay. (laughs) Yeah, so what ended up happening was uh, the cop ended up shining like this big bright light like they always do. Yeah. But he said that for some reason when he the cop 
asked him to put on the window, he felt a cold shiver. So what ended up happening was the cop, uh, you know, told him, hey, why were you going so fast? He said, well, I just got out of a gig and I'm supposed to be home at 10 o'clock, but it's 2 o'clock in the morning and I want to get back to my house. Right. So the cop ended up telling him, you know what, well, you were going 90 on the 60, so I'm going to have to give you a ticket. I mean, there's no other way you could have killed someone. Right. So he's like, okay, just go ahead and give me the ticket, you know, like, I I just want to get home. So, you know, he ended up writing him the ticket and everything, and he said, you know what, just be very careful out here because there's like, there might be like a a whole bunch of killers out on the road or whatever, so just drive safe and lock your doors. Uh Uh-huh. So he ended up going, you know, back home. The next day he said, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and pay the ticket. So he went down to the, uh, you know, to go pay the ticket. And uh, the lady up front said, well, what what are you here for? Well, I'm going to pay a ticket because I was going this much over the speed limit. So she checked the ticket and she said, okay, well, let me go ahead and just verify something real quick. So for some reason he said that they're – taking a long time and he said is everything okay and they're they're like yeah yeah but we're wondering who gave you this ticket so he said well there was this cop last night that gave me a ticket right and uh you know it was like three o'clock in the morning or two o'clock yes so she's so she's like okay well you, you well she got really upset and she said sir are you joking with me because you could get arrested for giving a fake ticket so he's like, no, no, actually, I mean, a cop actually wrote a ticket out for me for let, going let 30 me, miles over. Let me guess. That's a cop that had died, perhaps even on that road. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the cop had been dead since 1972. Uh Reason for him coming out in that road is because one time he pulled over a guy that was uh, had just committed murder. Oh. And he was trying to escape, so oh. the cop told him to come out of his car. And uh, as soon as he like, you know, he kind he kind of got a little bit uh, comfortable. He turned around, that guy ended up stabbing him to death. Oh so, my god! Yeah, and he so got a that, ticket that, from that, a cop that had been dead wow. since 1972. Not only that, but that cop's out there patrolling the same road again and again. Oh God! And he wrote out a ticket, and they had the proof of it. I, I, <laughs> uh, Barb, uh, did you hear that one? Yes, yeah, sir. <laughs> I guess uh, it's all around us, life and death. Um, let's let's quickly do number twenty-one. All right. Um, you remember the stock exchange building uh, where the drowning episode took place? This was from the the second time we had visited and <laughs> investigated this building. Right. Uh, you are going to uh, hear, I think it's Brendan. He says, okay, this is our second recording from the building. We are now getting ready to leave. And uh, an EVP is recorded here, and it says, it's dead. Oh, it's dead, Okay. Okay, this is our second recording from the gym. We are now getting ready to leave. This is death. This is death. This is death. Yikes. Um, do you think, well, the other recording you mentioned was, that was where the, the drowning was? Yes. Re- Oh, my. That's the same building. So maybe it was referring to that situation, I wonder. I don't know. I don't know. But that's the building where that uh, All right. uh, other one. We're woefully short on time here, and I'm just committed to trying to get these in. Those never heard uh, ever on the radio. So uh, number 22. All right, you're going to hear me um, talking about another EVP in this. You're going to hear me talking about uh, how the quality was, and, I, and I'm and i saying you can tell he's real quiet and draggy, and it sounds like it hurts him to talk. Mm-hmm. And um, this EVP was recorded, and it says, we can talk. 
we can talk. Okay, here we go. Now you can tell he's so draggy and quiet and tired of hurts him to talk. That's unnervingly clear. Uh, yes, that was recorded in the house that we uh, rented for several years. It was quite active. Oh, how, I guess for you, lucky. <laughs> I thought so, but... My husband Roger didn't. <laughs> I, I would imagine not. Um, I'm I'm with Roger all the way. One more time. Um, that was freaky. Now you can tell he's so draggy and quiet and tired. It hurts him to talk. Yikes. Yeah. Oh, I don't know about that. Um, obviously they can talk. Uh, it's a rarity, I suppose, but apparently they can. All right, uh, hold tight, Barbara, for just a second. Let's, uh, let me see, um, like a one-armed paper hanger here. Let's go to, uh, hmm, how about this one? You're on the air. Hello. Hi, good evening, Art. This is Millie. Hi, Millie. How are you? I'm doing good. Uh, love the show tonight. And I want to give a quick shout-out to the Art Bell Time Travelers on Facebook. And we have a quick question, and I will get to my story real quick. Okay, question? Um, at the beginning of the show, before the first DVP came out, there was a spliced voice that came in while the two of you were talking. And we don't think you heard it. We all heard it. Did I... you hear it? No. It, you're going to have to go back and listen to it. It was like right around the beginning, uh, okay. the first couple of EVPs. I think it was right before the first one. All right. Well, I can listen. I can, I can go into my, like you, were, you know, I'm a time traveler, believe me, so I will go and I will listen, I promise. All right. We thought you were haunted. Okay. Now, back in California, uh, we lived in a haunted apartment. Uh, a man had killed his girlfriend in there, and we knew it was haunted. You know, weird things happened in it. And we had these two friends that had been together forever. We took them over to our ex-brother-in-law's house for a barbecue. Well, she kind of got a hankering towards him. <laughs> and, you know, we didn't say anything uh, to the man. His name is Ron. And he was over drinking one day with us. And we had this table that my husband made by hand. It was a very strong table. You could jump up and down on it, and it wouldn't move. Right. Uh, and he was talking about his girlfriend, and we kind of lied about it. And every time we would lie, one of the legs started bending out. Oh, my. And I noticed it. My husband noticed it. And we tried to change the subject. You know, it hadn't fallen over yet, but it took about a half an hour. And within that half an hour, that leg bent out to the point where the table actually fell over. Oh, my. And my husband picked it up. Now, it had, the leg was from another table. It had a screw in the center of the leg, and it was attached to a table bracket. The bracket had a lip on the inside, so and so the leg kind of slanted out, which mm. made them really strong. Yes. Do you, do you know what I'm talking about? Yes, but There's how no it would bend, to... uh, no, 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 I don't know about that at all. And the, the screw was not bent. He put it back in, and it was fine. That table lasted for years, and it never did it again. But the more we lied about him, about where she was, <laughs> the more that thing bent until the leg, until the table fell over. Usually, it's a nose growing, not a table bowing. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think the lady that died in there was telling us, "Don't do it." <laughs> At least I had a laugh tonight. Uh, thank you so very very much for that story. My goodness, folks. All right, uh, let's go. Back over here and say, Barbara, you're back on the air again. Did you? That was quite a story, wasn't it? It was great. Okay, we're way short on time. I'm determined to get to the last two, so let's do it. Uh, number 23. All right. Uh, we were at a uh, bed and breakfast uh, place. It's a big mansion that they've turned into a bed and breakfast in Salt Lake. Right. And... Uh, the woman that was on staff that night, she was showing us around, and she 
said uh, there was this little table by the uh, play office that she sat in, and she's, she's looking at this book that had pictures of the original homeowners of this mansion. Right. And she said, you're going to hear her say, this is, yeah, this was the main guy. It's Dr. Edward, Wood, Edward Woodruff and his wife. And then this EVP says, very feisty. <laughs> very feisty, really. Well, that's a new one. This was, yeah, this was the main guy, Dr. Edward Woodruff. Why? Wow. The unusual things that come from the other side. It's just, uh, what a comment. Very feisty. That, that's <laughs> and it makes you wonder, did he know the Dr. Ed Wood, Wood, Woodruff's wife? <laughs> yeah, well, you're, that's right. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Okay, last one, last one, Barb. All right, this is a Utah cemetery, and it was a, the cemetery that we've gotten so many great EVPs from. This voice, we recorded him many times in the first couple of years that we would go there. Really? Uh, we, or there were several of them that had the same voice, but anyway, you're going to hear... Uh, we were discussing a, a voice that was previously recorded in, uh, and that said A Company when a military headstone was being read aloud. Oh. And Roger was relating this and erroneously said uh, Company A, r real proud. You'll hear Roger say that. And uh, I recorded this voice repeating him, Company A. <laughs> so, okay, here we go. Wow. Um, wow, that's a real wow, So, and also very clear. So this is a military man, very, very proud of Company A. One more time. Company A. Company A. <laughs> From the other side, that, that's actually one of the best ones I've ever heard. And you can hear in this military man's voice that he's very, very proud of the fact that he's Company A one last time. Company A. Company A. <laughs> I would say that was uh, that was uttered in a in a in a proud uh, military manner. I would agree. Well, Barb, um, it has been unusually amazing tonight, a uh, mixture that we've done and. I don't know how to thank you for doing this. I know it took a very great deal of prep on the part of my uh, producer and working with you, and uh, and then to be able to mix it with some of the greatest stories we've ever had on a show of this sort. Great stories tonight. Yeah, yeah, absolutely great stories. So I want to thank you and all of the GIS, but especially Barbara, who stuck it out with us on uh, what's about to become Halloween. Thank you, dear lady. Thank you very much, Art. Always a pleasure. Good night. That's Barbara. She's really something. Really, really something. Thank you all. I wish we, you know, the lines are stacked. I wish we could get you all in. But this is now only a three-hour show. So we have to stop when we have to stop. I hope uh, all the little ones enjoy their candy gathering for the morrow. And uh, be it safe, please. From the high desert to all 25 time zones out there. Dead air, it says. Good night.